Yes, we place these two talks next to each other because they have um, pretty tightly related topics. And I would also like to give credit to Titsanio Kolev and Veselin Dobrev, who um, uh, really started this analysis that I'll be presenting today about spatial coarsening. So let's see. Whoops, here we go. So we'll do a brief introduction to multigrid reduction in time or MGRIT. We'll do a brief review of existing two grid convergence analysis and then look at what changes when spatial coarsening occurs. And as you saw with Daniel's talk, um, it can definitely negatively impact convergence, especially for the F relaxation case, which um, can be equivalent to paravial. And then I have a few um, model problem numerical results just to illustrate things. So overall, our approach for parallel in time is to sort of leverage our expertise in multigrid. Our motivation is similar to probably everyone speaking this week that you know, clock speeds are stagnant, but we want to search for speed up through more concurrency. And so we look to apply parallelism in the time dimension. Um, and overall, we're solving some global space-time system, um, usually a nonlinear system of A of U is equal to B. And we solve it with the multigrid V cycle that does some sort of relaxation or smoothing, moves to a coarser grid and does smoothing or relaxation there, all the way down to a very coarse grid and then we interpolate an error correction back to the finest grid. So that's just a broad overview of our multigrid approach. Now, for the technical approach and how we do our theoretical derivation, it's um, highly related to Daniel's talk. We'll be looking at the linear setting. Um, the analysis becomes much more tractable in this case. And we consider also general one-step methods. So time step I is equal to phi, applied to time step I minus one. And then you have a forcing term GI. And can everyone see my mouse? I just want to make sure that people can see the pointer. Okay, thank you, Gemma. And then in a linear setting, just for simplicity in this slide, you get this system of equations here with identity on the diagonal and negative phi on the subdiagonal. And if you were to solve this system, it's lower triangular with forward substitution, you get sequential time marching. U zero is equal to G zero. And then u1 is equal to phi applied to u0 plus g1. And if you do that forward substitution, you get sequential time marching. Our approach instead solves this system of equations iteratively with a multigrid method. And we take our motivation for multigrid reduction techniques, um, which go back at least to the late 70s. Um, we course in only in time and an iteration of multigrid reduction is, is O of N and highly parallel. And so that's good as well. So a little more detail on multigrid reduction. So let's take a look at this timeline where we've taken a set of uniformly distributed points in time and partitioned them into C points and F points. The C points in red go on to form the coarse grid and the F points in black live only on the fine grid. The union of C and F together forms your fine grid and just the C points form your coarse grid. And you have a coarsening factor of M here. So your coarse grid time step size, big delta T is M times small delta T. Relaxation is a highly parallel procedure that does block Jacobi between F and C points. And then after relaxation, we form a coarse grid. And on the, on the left, you see A delta, and this is a smaller system. This is your coarse grid matrix. And it has N over M block rows, where again, remember M is your coarsening factor. And A delta is sort of an ideal coarse grid operator. And it's ideal because we have phi to the Mth power here. So we coarse in M time steps and then just put phi to the M as our time stepping operator. Now, obviously that's impractical because it's as expensive as the fine grid matrix, but A delta provides motivation. And this is the approximate reduction in the name is we then substitute phi sub delta, a coarse time stepper for this ideal time stepper. So you can think of this as being one time step with a very big time step size instead of M time steps with a small time step size. And if you do this recursively, you can get a multi-level hierarchy. So that's briefly what M grid is. Um, now we'll look at the two grid uh, error analysis. So MGRIT is a residual correction scheme at the coarse grid, so at the C points, and the key approximation made 
is an approximation where B delta that you saw in the previous slide approximates A delta. And so the uh, iteration operator here, E superscript F, the superscript F is for F relaxation, um, is a very simple residual correction scheme. It's just I minus B delta inverse A delta. And I reproduce here what A delta, B delta, and a reminder of what the course grid looks like, where the C points are. And because this is a reduction-based method, it implies you only examine the error on the course grid. We have what we call ideal interpolation that maps exact course grid solution at the C points to an exact solution at F points. So if you had the exact solution, exact numerical solution at all the C points, interpolation just injects that and then does time stepping to fill in the values. So you get exact solutions at your F points as well. As well. Now we also use a somewhat more powerful and expensive relaxation scheme called FCF. And FCF um, does relaxation at F points, then C points, and then F points. And what that means um, abstractly is that each C point is then updated with phi to the M applied to the previous C point. So if you do time stepping to fill in the F points and then time stepping to fill in the C points, you're essentially just taking phi to the M and propagating from one C point to the next. And that, if you think about it, is just Jacobi with this ideal course grid operator A delta. So FCF on the course grid is just a Jacobi relaxation with error propagator I minus A delta. If that was a little, if you didn't follow all of that, just make sure that you record here at the bottom these two different error propagators, one for F relaxation and one for FCF. And this is a simple residual correction scheme. This is the same simple residual correction scheme with an extra Jacobi relaxation sweep of I minus A delta. And to then now do some error bounds on this, we make a few more assumptions. Let's have the spatial discretization be fixed over all time steps on both levels. And now each spatial eigenvalue omega is going to imply one eigenvalue for phi and phi delta. So in essence, we're assuming that phi and phi delta can be diagonalized by the same set of eigenvectors. And each of these eigenvalues is omega. So then the spatial eigenvalues of omega imply eigenvalues for phi and phi delta. So lambda omega is an eigenvalue for phi and mu omega is an eigenvalue on the course grid. And this is just the formula that you would get for backward Euler um, to give you some intuition, right? So the eigenvalue for backward Euler is just one plus delta T times the spatial eigenvalue inverse. And on the course grid, you take a bigger time step value. So these are just the eigenvalues of phi on the fine grid eigenvalues of phi on the course grid. And if you go through some algebra, which is not terribly enlightening, so I'll skip it, um, you can get this uh, bound on the F relaxation error propagator. And this term here makes a lot of sense. It's saying, you know, we want M time steps with the fine grid propagator to be very close to one time step on the course grid. Again, here's sort of A delta and B delta, where you want this operator, M time steps, to be similar to one course grid time step. And then this is a removable singularity that comes out of the B delta inverse. This just repeats the F relaxation propagator so that you can compare it with the FCF. And you'll notice here with the FCF bound, we just have one extra term. So this for the F relaxation bound is repeated here except we have one extra term here of lambda to the mth power. And this is what comes from the extra Jacobi sweep. So you can see if you have the diffusive phi, so if the eigenvalues of phi that are less than one, um, FCF relaxation strongly damps those errors. Ignoring this derivation, what does it mean? Well, here are our bounds again. Remember the lambda here, these are the eigenvalues of phi, the mu, eigenvalues of phi delta on the course grid, and the omega is a subscript to reference a spatial eigenvalue. So we've diagonalized everything, say with Fourier modes, and we're just looking at the maximum of this bound over all of the eigenvalues, say all of the Fourier modes. And M is the coarsening rate in time, say two, four, eight, 16, 32, something like that. And you'll notice that these bounds are very nice, um, in that they're agnostic to the space-time discretization, 
But obviously the space-time discretization and the problem type affect the character of lambda and mu and therefore can affect the bounds. So let's look at a few cases. So now here we assume strictly positive and real omega. So this is a bit like a hyperbolic problem. And we plot the convergence bound for each scaled spatial eigenvalue dt omega on the x-axis down here. So this goes from a really small spatial eigenvalue up to something larger. And we look at two different coarsening factors, coarsened by two in time and 32 in time. And for backward Euler, um, there's not a huge difference between F relaxation in black and FCF in magenta. And the different coarsening factors aren't very different either. However, if we go to a higher order time step or say S Dirk three, we see that the convergence bound um, for, S -DIRK, for FCF is much lower. So the convergence bound here, the worst case convergence is for this eigenvalue here, and it's below 10 to the minus two. So that means one iteration gives you two digits of accuracy, whereas one iteration here of just F relaxation gives you a little less than a digit of accuracy. So for a higher order time stepper here, you get quite a payoff from FCF. Now, if you go to strictly imaginary eigenvalues, um, you're looking at something more like a hyperbolic problem. And here we just look at the strictly positive half of the imaginary axis. The plots reflect if you go and look at the negative part. Here we look at backward Euler again, and just for consistency, say S Dirk 3. And you'll notice the only method that has a convergence bound uniformly below one is for M equals two and backward Euler. For S Dirk 3, here you can trace along here where the bound for one is. And you'll notice that all of these methods poke just barely above one for at least some spatial eigenvalues. Just telling us what we already know that hyperbolic problems are, are difficult. Um, as Daniel um, discussed, if you add some artificial dissipation, things help. Um, so you can add artificial dissipation here with um, a fourth order centered finite differencing with artificial dissipation. You can actually push convergence for the S Dirk 3 case down below one. For the FCF case here, you actually get convergence of about 0.1 abound. So you can play games with artificial dissipation and get better convergence is probably the takeaway here. But this is just meant to be a review of sort of where this existing approach to analysis is and what happens now if we spatially coarse it. Because you might be thinking, why are we doing S Dirk 3 for an advective problem? Don't people generally like to do explicit schemes? And you're right, people do. But to do an explicit scheme, you need to have stability on the coarse grids. And to do have stability on the coarse grids, you have to decrease your spatial mesh size along with delta T. So let's look at spatial coarsening. So let's let PX and RX be spatial interpolation operators for a single time step. So P, X, interpolates from a coarse spatial grid to a fine spatial grid, and Rx is its counterpart. It goes from that fine spatial grid to a coarse spatial grid at just a single time step. Now, we want to have a global spatial interpolation and restriction over all time steps, so we can just stack Px and Rx along the diagonals. And we'll just call R bar and P bar the sort of global interpolation and restriction operators. And the error propagators change just a little bit. We basically have to restrict down to the coarse grid. Then we solve the residual equation on the coarse grid with B delta inverse. And then we have to interpolate back to the fine spatial grid. And now for FCF relaxation, we get something very similar. We just insert a P and an R in the same spots. And we again have the extra term from the FCF relaxation here. And now we want to take these error propagators here and here and try to deduce, derive bounds similar to what we saw before. Um, and to do that, we have to make a few more assumptions to make the analysis, the pencil and paper more tractable. And so let's do something very simple. Let's consider factor of two spatial coarsening in 1D for periodic domains. This allows us to use a Fourier basis and simple formula. And when you have, you know, a 1D domain with uniformly spaced points in 
uniformly spaced points in space, um, and you're looking at 4A modes and you're doing restriction and interpolation, it's very common that you'll have two modes on the fine grid get aliased down to a single coarse grid mode. And that's the case that we consider here. So you have a single coarse grid eigenvalue or eigenmode V, and it's, it's going to be aliased back and forth with two modes on the fine grid. So if you can, if you think about this, the mode, one of these modes is going to be smooth and can be represented on the coarse grid, and the other mode is going to be very oscillatory and is going to get aliased to that smooth mode on the coarse grid. So that's all that this is saying. Then we can take these pairs of fine grid modes with single coarse grid modes, and we can look at diagonalizing phi delta, so phi delta is on the coarse grid, diagonalize this with our single coarse mode. And then we can also diagonalize the fine grid operator according to these pairs of modes on the fine grid. And this just says mathematically what we've been describing, that interpolation takes one of these coarse grid modes and maps it to an alias combination of V sort of subcheck and V hat um, on the fine grid. And restriction also maps V, the sort of down check to V and maps V hat to V on the coarse grid. And these are the assumptions that we have to make about aliasing modes between the fine and the coarse grid, diagonalizing our time steppers like before, and some assumptions here that you have these little constants R check and R hat, P check and P hat, and that these little P's and little R's denote how well your interpolation and restriction operators map between the fine and the coarse grid. We make these assumptions, we go through some algebra, and we get slightly different bounds. So here's the bound for F relaxation. This is um, what we saw before. And then we have this new term O and new term D. So O defined down here, and you'll notice that O looks a lot like the term you saw before, which is this lambda to the M minus mu. Lambda to the M minus mu is what we had before. But now we have this sort of pairing of two modes together. And we also have these P, little p and little r. Remember, little p and little r define how restriction and interpolation map modes between the fine and the coarse grid. Then we also have this operator D, and D looks like this. And maybe a good sort of sanity check is that if Px and Rx are the identity, D goes to zero, so this goes away. And then O becomes what we had before, just lambda to the M minus mu. And you might be trying to make sense of this, but this ties the analysis in many ways back to what Daniel was discuss discussing, is that this operator D has eigenvalue one. So we have this error propagator is less than or equal to this term plus something that has an eigenvalue of one. And so what this means is that this approach to analysis cannot show that parareal guarantees monotonic convergence or M grit with F relaxation. So two grit M grit with F relaxation as shown by Martin Gander and Stefan Vandeval is, is equivalent to parareal. And so I should have mentioned that earlier, but that's why this parareal is in parentheses right here. So the F relaxation case, we can't guarantee monotonic convergence. And we'll look at the effect on FCF relaxation in a minute. But the big takeaway is the error is less than or equal to sort of what we had before, but a new term that you know, we can't bound below one. You can diagonalize this and do a little bit of algebra to show that this D term um, has an eigenvalue of one. So we can do a little sanity check, say just for the 1D heat equation. We do backward Euler, classic second order center finite differences, a two level solver, and about a thousand by thousand space time grid. And we course in by 16 in time, and we do F relaxation. This is the case of no spatial coarsening, and this is the per iteration convergence factor. So the per iteration convergence factor, we get a really great iteration. And then the asymptotic convergence factor is about 0.18. It's not bad. You're making good progress to the solution. As you can see here, the residual is going down quite nicely. Now we add in this coarsening by two in space with linear interpolation and sort of full weighting restriction. 
you can do injection restriction and, and you get the same results. But you'll see that uh, the method stagnates. Um, spatial coarsening fails to converge monotonically as predicted. The convergence factor approaches one. And that agrees well with, with both what Daniel showed and up here where we have this term D that we cannot bound below one. And this is just for the 1D heat equation and simple interpolation formula. Now, if we switch to FCF relaxation, the story does change somewhat. So same problem, backward Euler, second order centered finite differencing, two levels, thousand by thousand space time grid. This is the case of no spatial coarsening. The convergence is a little bit faster with FCF. It's a right below 0.1. But now we add in coarsening in space and the per iteration convergence factor is still almost the same. And the difference is that spatial coarsening with FCF relaxation um, is able to damp this O and D term with an extra lambda. So if you go through the same analysis with FCF relaxation, you'll notice that you get this lambda term here. And this lambda term is, is basically these little lambdas to the M. So we're taking lambda to the M, little lambda to the M, and scaling the D block and the O block by it. But in particular, we're scaling this D block by lambda to the M. And for the heat equation, the eigenvalues for phi are, be are below one. And so we have values below one that we're raising to the, mth, to the mth power. So we're able for the heat equation to take this term and scale it down with FCF relaxation. And you can see here that you know, the convergence effect is not so negative when you introduce spatial coarsening. Now FCF is more expensive than F relaxation. So you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, um, but theoretically it's, it's, it's certainly interesting to see. Now, if we switch to what we really want to solve, advection equations, um, we can go to something very simple, Ford Euler with upwinding finite differencing, um, two level, thousand by thousand, and we set the CFL a little bit away from its limit of 1.0. We coarsen by two in time and two in space. This is so that the CFL number stays the same on every grid, and we have a stable time stepper on every grid. And we can see here for F relaxation, our convergence factor again approaches one. This is what the theory predicts is that spatial coarsening, you, know, you can't guarantee a nice monotonic convergence. Um, we introduce FCF relaxation and this lambda term here, lambda to the M, we have these little lambda to the Ms inside the capital lambda is able to give us back some convergence. So it's not that fast, but the convergence rate is about 0.5 7.6, we're still making progress towards the solution. So that's at least an improvement. You might be saying backward Euler and um, first order uh, finite differencing is not a very accurate discretization. So what happens if we switch to something better? Let's do RK4 with fourth order finite differencing and artificial dissipation. And I'm running out of time, so I'll just skip down here. And you can see that the convergence factor deteriorates with FCF relaxation. We don't show any F or no spatial coarsening because no spatial coarsening is unstable and F relaxation again fails to converge. But with FCF, we are able to observe some convergence for at least a somewhat accurate discretization. Um, I'll go through this very quickly. I just have a couple more slides. Um, you can show through this technique that convergence goes to one as DT goes to one. As your time step size, um, no, as dt goes to zero, I apologize. Um, I'll correct that here just so that nobody gets confused on what I'm saying. So as dt goes to zero, convergence can go to, goes to one. And if you think about it, as dt goes to zero, your fine grid eigenvalues go to one. And then this term here causes problems, whether you use f or fcf. And so that's curious. Um, you can redefine the coarse grid propagator by wrapping it with P and RX on both sides. And this can improve convergence somewhat, but again, there's no free lunch. You do have to do more coarsening and interpolation. Um, the above experiments generally hold for other coarsening factors and when moving to multi-level, but the advection case does deteriorate um, some when you go to multi-level, whereas the parabolic case doesn't deteriorate much at all. Um, in summary, 
Um, spatial coarsening um, is has a pretty negative impact for F relaxation, and that that it is equivalent to the perihelial case, and is um, you know agrees with, with Daniel's analysis. We can't guarantee monotonic convergence for in relatively straightforward cases. FCF relaxation can restore convergence, but with the added cost of doing more relaxation. Um, this is just a summary of the previous results, which I'll skip and just go to here for some selected references on theory developments for MGRIT. And then this is the software that I use to generate the results. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Rob for any questions.